I love to canoe. I love to canoe. I uh, went with my father as a boy and, and uh, went up to the Boundary Waters. And ever since that time, I, I've loved to, to be in a canoe and to experience God's creation in that way. And uh, I've owned canoes for the last 36 years, I think at least four different ones. But during that time, I've had one canoe that I've always kept and always will keep. I've done thousands of miles in that canoe, literally. I've been on Lake Erie and other Great Lakes. I've been <coughs> in tiny streams where you could hardly paddle at all. I've been in uh, rushing rivers. I've been on the Mississippi. I've been on scenic rivers. I've been all kinds of amazing places. I've seen the wilderness of Canada via canoe. I've been through swamps and storms and beautiful days and rough water and rapids and just all kinds of things. I love to canoe. But one thing I don't love about canoeing is paddling upstream. I have a story about that. Um, uh, the first time that I went along with Joel um, to a place called the Buffalo River in Arkansas, um, we paddled a, a patch that was a national scenic river at the time, so it was very rustic. And you didn't see people because nobody liked not having toilets, I guess. I don't know. But it was, a, it was a lot of fun on that 25 miles or so that we went. He told me that when we got to the end of the river with a few little white waters, but um, mostly a, a nice small river, when we got there, it would flow into the White River, which is much bigger. Um, but we would have to paddle upstream, and, and we could do it if, because he did it with this guy. And, <laughs> and we could do it, and we just had to work really hard at it, but there was a point of no return. And so he asked me when we got to that point, are you ready? To, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, oh, sure. Sounds blah, blah, blah. Well, we didn't know that up upriver in the White River, they had opened the floodgates of the dam that morning. And that river was raging, just raging. Well, we got out there, and I'm telling you, my heart just pounded. Well, we went as fast as we could, it was fast, but we just, we couldn't buck that tide. We finally got to somewhere we could grab onto a rock, and we held on for dear life. And um, fortunately, eventually, my arms were getting so tired, a man came along with a small boat with a motor on. He said, grab on. I was glad it was the other arm. <laughs> we grabbed on, and he took us to safety. Swimming or canoeing upriver is, is not something I want to do again. <laughs> Don't tell them these stories. Nobody will go with me anymore. <laughs> You know, I spent a lot of my life trying to paddle up river, trying to do it on my own. It doesn't usually work very well. I want you to think about this as we talk this morning. This is really kind of our analogy. Relationships are like canoeing. Relationships are like canoeing. So I'm not sure I get this. The analogy of the river... And the canoe is... Well, it's kind of like the river is life. You know, I've got a river of life. <laughs> uh, you know, we, the river is life. And the canoe is a relationship. Or actually, you know, the, the, what takes place in that canoe. Um, <clears throat> the stream you're on makes a big difference, of course. It's, uh, you know, if, if you've got a small, placid stream, you know, it's, it's just basically floating downstream and guiding the canoe if you are going through rapids, it's a whole different story, and uh, you have to know what you're doing. But uh, the, the river you're on makes a big difference, but also the canoe you're in, because different canoes are designed for different activities. There are canoes that are designed to take rapids. There are canoes that are designed to haul huge loads and anything in between. Single canoes, double canoes, triple canoes, uh, ultralights to great big heavy things. So, you know, canoes, there are canoes that are as long as this room. So, I mean, there's all kinds of canoes, but generally, generally, canoeing by yourself is harder. I've done a lot of canoeing by myself, and, and it can be really difficult. And it's not as fun, for me at least, to, to canoe as it is by myself as it is to canoe with somebody that I really feel like I can trust and that I'm in sync with. Most of the time, the river or the canoe that makes the trip most, in, or most of the time, it's not the river or the canoe that makes the trip most enjoyable. It's the person you're with. When you're in a relationship, you're always vulnerable, aren't you? 
like uh, going on a journey, a relationship takes on a life of its own, right? In a canoe, there are two basic roles that you have. There's a person in the front, and that's called the bow. And there's a person in the back, and that's called the stern. Now, the front person is to provide at least 55% of the locomotion. And they're supposed to watch out for rocks underneath the water and things that the person in the back can't see. And other than that, they're pretty much supposed to do whatever the person in the back tells them to do. Um, uh, you you want to say something? I, I do. <laughs> Pastor Joel is a really good teacher and mentor, especially in outdoor things. Um, so he taught me early on how to do all these important things, the J-strokes and the sweeps and the, all those things and how that would make the canoe go and what I could do with it and how we could row together or whatever we call it, paddle together, I guess. So um, one day he says, I think you're ready to get in the stern. You go ahead and take the back and, and, and it's going to be great. And he's calling out you know, J-strokes and whatever to me because I was supposed to be in the stern, but he was helping me. So finally I got it where we weren't talking and I'm paddling and I'm paying attention and I'm looking carefully at the way I'm supposed to be going and it got harder. And I couldn't figure out why and I looked up there and here he had put his paddle down and ch exchanged it for a, a, a little line in the, in the water. <laughs> And along with that line in the water, I got J stroke, J stroke. No, 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 the fish is over there. I gotta get the fish. I said, oh, no, the sweep now, the sweep now. Donna, you're making us go the wrong way. Well, here's what I did to handle that I took the paddle and I set it in the canoe too. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't do any fussing at all because that's not my nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, you're telling things you don't need to tell, but <coughs> when we get in the canoe with God, the one in the stern is not us. The one in the stern is not us. Think about this. God wants an all-in relationship with you. So we're going to pick up today's scripture, and it goes back quite a bit from what you've already heard, but it's kind of in the middle of another idea and it's switching here, so we kind of picked it up almost like in the middle of a sentence, but, but uh, pay attention closely and, and uh, it speaks to us about the relationship that God wants to have with each one of us. Don't you know <clears throat> that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. <coughs> Sometime back, I was fishing with Dick Anschutz. Poor guy, I hit him up two times in a row now. But uh, <laughs> we, were, we were down on Kincaid Lake fishing for muskies, and we were kind of novices at this, really didn't know what we were doing and we were trying but we weren't having any luck and we were at the boat dock and we started talking to this guy and it turned out this guy was like the president or one of the officers of the local musky fishing club and and the next day they were having a big deal they were taking veterans out for free and 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 letting them uh, fish with them in their boats and showing them how to catch musky and this guy found out that Dick was a veteran. He said, hey, I don't have anybody to go with tomorrow. You guys can come with me. You know, out of the clear blue, here we get to go out with a guy who's almost a professional musky fisher and spend the whole day with him just, just you know, letting him teach us and, and share his knowledge with us. What a, what a gift that was. What a gift that was. You know, he invited us into his boat for a day. God invites us into his canoe for eternity. Uh, this morning at 1103 service, a friend of ours is going to be baptized, Jennifer Boone. And Jennifer came to Milburn. She was kind of a sad person. Life had been kind of hard on her. and She was lonely and didn't think people would like her. And there she found a family that loved her. And more importantly, she found a God that loved her and accepted her and, and embraced her and her many gifts and talents. And, and uh, she just blossomed. She just blossomed, and today she is choosing 
to be baptized. You know, that symbol of going down under the water and dying to ourselves and coming up a new creation in God, getting into God's canoe. You know, she's going to do that. And she wanted to make sure that, not, I believe she's already done that spiritually, but I, she wanted to make sure that people knew and affirmed what she had done in her heart already. She's gotten into the canoe with God. That's what you have to do. You have to get in the canoe. It is, it is through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection the door is open to an all-in relationship with God. But you have to get in the canoe. Scripture goes on. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. United in a resurrection like his, like Jesus. God knows where we're going, and that's to the promised land, to heaven. And that journey starts right now. But you have to get in the canoe. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might, not, might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the ones you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. You know, sin is kind of like the baggage that we have when we are thinking about getting into the canoe. I've uh, had guys go with me for years, and occasionally even myself, I've taken too much junk. And you get in that canoe, and it's only clearing about that much water. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're loaded down, and, and it's bad enough. But then if the water gets heavy and the waves start piling up, boy, it can be really scary. And the waves start coming in, and then you get more water in the boat, and pretty soon, you know, it's really laden down. It's dangerous. And, boy, if you go in overloaded into the rapids, it is really, really dangerous. It can, it can take your life. You have to get in the canoe, but in order to do that, you need to trust God to be in charge, and you need to trust God enough to let go of your baggage and leave it behind and trust God to make up the difference, to leave your junk behind. The relationship God is looking from us, for from us, is a relationship of total surrender. When God is in the stern and you get rid of the junk, something wonderful can happen. You can kind of get in sync with God and start paddling together in the same rhythm. And life just has a way of moving on with great grace and joy. Uh, you know, it's funny that Donna and I weren't paragons of health in any way. Uh, a number of years ago, we went up to Canada with our boys. And, and they were amazed that their overweight uh, ancient parents could out paddle them. But it was simply because we weren't fighting each other. We'd been in a canoe before. We, you know, knew each other, and we just had a sort of a, a rhythm that we got going. And, and we were so much more efficient than they were. They were probably expending a lot more energy, but we were still getting long and going farther. And that's what can happen in our relationship with God. But you have to get in the canoe. <clears throat> but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. By becoming a slave to God, we are set free to have a relationship with God as it was intended and to become a new creation in Christ. But you have to get in the canoe. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. And I always like to say, remember, that starts now. Just as Pastor Joel said, eternal life starts now. 
but the gift of the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord I shared a little bit before about my college years I was a long way from God I thought I could do it on my own and I was trying really hard and, and basically my life was a shipwreck I bet a lot of you have been there at some time or another but but look where we are going and who we are going with. We are going with God to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And this trip is just starting. The adventure begins the moment you step into the canoe and it never ends. It never ends. But you've got to get in the canoe. Listen to the promise of God. The promise of becoming a slave to God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus our Lord. But you have to get in the canoe. I got in the canoe when I was about 12 years old. And stayed there for a little while, but then I, I got out. I thought I could do it better on my own. I thought I could make it better my way. Do it what I wanted to do. And so I was paddling upstream and downstream and across the streams. And I was even getting out of the streams sometimes. And then I hit the rapids, and it nearly killed me, nearly took me out. After almost 10 years, I finally got back in the canoe, and God took my messed up life and began to refresh it and renew it. And so I wanted to sing a song that's kind of my theme song. You may have heard me sing it before. If you have, I apologize, and I've been sick all week. You can tell I don't have much voice, so pray for me. Pray for the song. But as you, as you listen to it, uh, look at the slides that are on the screen and, and think about yourself. Think about the ones you love. Think about your relationships. Think about your life. And most of all, think about the relationship you have with God, the God who loves you so much that one touch can change everything. Well, it was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer felt it was hardly worth his while to waste much time on that old violin, but he held it up with a smile. It sure ain't much, but it's all we got left. I guess I ought to sell it too. Now who's got a bid on this old violin? Just one more and we'll be through. And then he cried, one, give me one dollar. Who make it two? Only two dollars. Who make it three? Three dollars twice, now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? Raise up your hand and don't wait any longer. The auction's about to end. Who's got four, just one dollar more to bid on that old violin? Well, the air was hot and the people stood round as the sun was setting low. From the back of the crowd, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. He wiped the dust from the old violin, and he tightened up the strings. And he played out a melody, pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing. Then the music stopped. And the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, he said, what are my bids for this old violin? Then he held it up with a bow. And then he cried, one, give me one thousand. Who make it two? Only two thousand. Who make it three? Three thousand twice, now that's a good price, but who's got a bid for me? The people called out, what made the change? We don't understand. 
Then the auctioneer stopped and he said with a smile, It was the touch of the master's hand. Now you know many people with their lives out of tune are battered and scarred with sin. And they're auctioned off cheap to a thankless crowd, much like that old violin. Then the master comes and a foolish crowd they never understand. The worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. And then he cried, one, give me one thousand. Who make it two? Only two thousand. Who make it three? <clears throat> three thousand twice. Now that's a good price. But who's got a bid for me? The people called out, what made the change? We don't understand. Then the auctioneer stopped and he said with a smile, it was the touch of the master's hand. Let us pray. The touch of the master's hand. Oh, God, we thank you for your touch on our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you've opened up for us the opportunity to get into your canoe and to ride with you the rest of our lives on into eternity. So, Lord, we pray today that as we think about this, our relationships, our lives, that we let go of the junk and we make that commitment. We make that decision right now if we haven't made it. And if we had made it, we make it again to renew that commitment and to stay with it all of our lives, to be in the canoe with you, to trust you to be in the stern, to guide our lives, to direct it. We give it all to you, Lord. Pain, shame, power, and all the other stuff, all the baggage of sin in our lives, we give it all to you. Take us, Lord, and make us yours. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.